Revelation chapter 22, first five verses of that chapter are a continuation of the description of New Jerusalem, as we talked about in Revelation chapter 21. We started in verse number six on last week, and we I had, these, I had this idea in my mind that we would finish the chapter, and I think we got to the end of verse 9. And so I'm not even, <clears throat> with further study this week, not even going to assume that we'll get anywhere near the end of the chapter today. But um, I'll mention several things with the help of the Lord. Certainly pray the Lord to help us this morning. Several passages of Scripture in this chapter that are very difficult, that's for sure. We'll look at some things. I want to read. I want to begin reading from verse number six. I do want to say this before I even begin reading, and we'll read through the end of the chapter. The first five verses, that, as I've already mentioned, are a conclusion of the description of New Jerusalem. And in verse number six, Paul, as, as you know, Paul is on the Isle of Patmos. The Lord is giving him, giving him these, this vision of the future, John, I'm sorry, Reverend, thank you. The Lord is giving John this, this vision of the future, and he's been writing about all of these things through the book of Revelation. As you know, at the beginning of chapter 21, he began to see this new heaven, this new earth, and this new Jerusalem, and he's been writing about those things. So when you come to verse number 6, John goes all the way back to the chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, the beginning of the tribulation period and all those kind of things. And so keep that in mind as we read from verse number 6 through the end of the chapter. And then we'll pray together and ask the Lord to help us. This is the summation or the conclusion of the book of Revelation. He's going to mention several things that he's talked about throughout the book of Revelations and some new things as well. But in verse number 6, he says, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. Aren't, aren't you glad that the Word of God is reliable? Amen. Aren't you glad the Word of God is faithful? There's, there's very few faithful men left in our world today. It was one time true that there were many, many, and there still are some. Please don't think I'm throwing everybody under this umbrella. But there's, there's not all that many faithful people left in this world, it doesn't seem like. And I've made the statement numerous times lately, and I'm sure whether you've made the statement or not, you have thought it in your own mind. There is very little of what I hear anymore that I have any confidence at all in it being true. It doesn't matter which party it comes from. I don't believe one any more than I believe the other. It doesn't matter which news media you seem to be listening to or wanting to hear something from. I have very little confidence in anything that they have to say. There's just not many faithful men and women left in the world. And there's not much left that we can put much confidence in in being true. But I sure am glad we have a Bible. And regardless of the year... And regardless of the time, it doesn't matter if it's an election year or not. It doesn't matter if there's a pandemic or not. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. My Bible will always be faithful and its words will always be true. You have, you have no idea what a blessing that is. Uh, something that is solid, something that is uh, reliable, we have that in the Word of God. So, these sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the things of this book, worship God. And that's where we ended at on last week, last Sunday morning, talking about worshiping God. I am, we are caught up, not, not necessarily us, at least I hope not us, but our world 
is caught up in worshiping many things. Uh, we are wholly given to idolatry. And God help us to be faithful. You and I who know the Lord Jesus Christ, may God help us to be faithful to worship God. I made mention of the fact of a couple of things as I was concluding that our praying is not worship. That is praying. Our Bible reading is not worship. That is Bible reading. Our church attendance is not worship. That's church attendance. Our singing is not necessarily worship. That is us singing. Worship is as Mary when she sat at the feet of Jesus and washed his feet with her hair and anointed her, his feet with that precious ointment. Martha was cumbered about many things. But you know what the Lord said about Mary? He said, but this one thing is needful. You know what is needful in our life? That we get out of the rat race. That we get our mind off of the things of the world. Oftentimes, I, I, please, please don't misunderstand me and say something that I did not say. Sometimes we are so busy in the service and the work of the Lord that we forget to worship the Lord. Sometimes we get so caught up in, in good things. These are good things. I promise you I do not pray too much. But I promise you I pray more than I worship at His feet. I, I have never and I've not known anyone that could read his book too much. But I am afraid that I am more guilty of reading his word than I am sitting at his feet. You hear me? I, I think that the Bible teaches we should be faithful. We ought to be faithful. There is no substitute in my opinion, not just in my opinion, but I believe in what the Bible teaches than being faithful to assemble yourselves together as a manner of some is. But I'm afraid a lot of times that we allow that to be a substitute for our worship. And it is not. Our worship is when we see Jesus as who He is, high and lifted up. When we recognize that we are deplorable and despicable and lowly, and deserving of wrath and judgment, but in His mercy, He has so freely and so willingly forgiven us of our sin. And we forget about all the things of this world, and our mind, and our heart, and our attention, and our focus is upon Him for what He has done for me. Not necessarily, and not solely, in the fact that He's given me a great home in which to live in although I'm extremely thankful for that. Not in just that He has given me raiment to wear, though I am very grateful for that. Not just that He has given me the best that man can provide as far as being able to take nourishment into our body. Listen, friend, I am thankful, I am grateful for those things. My far more important than that is I need to recognize and realize that I was on my way to hell without a God. I had no hope. I had no covenant, I had no assurance, I didn't have anything. And yet He willingly took my place so that I could be saved. I think it will help you, I think it will encourage you, I think it will strengthen you to just spend some time sitting at the feet of Jesus and worshiping God. May the Lord help me to do that more. Now, verse number 10 is where we'll begin this morning, begin talking about the fullness of time is at hand. I'll read, I, I wanted to read the chapter. I'll, I'll try to read it without making a comment. Verse number 10 says, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. 
For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters. And whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is the thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the, of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Three times in this chapter, the Lord said, I come quickly. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Well, we certainly have enjoyed the good singing, the good fellowship. I pray you'd help me now for a few moments as we try, with the help of the Lord, to rightly divide this scripture and proclaim truth from this great chapter in the Bible. Lord, I certainly need your help to do that. I pray that you would give me clarity of thought, understanding of the scripture. And Lord, I pray you'd help me to relay them in such a way that there'll be a help and a blessing to the people. And Lord, for that, we'll certainly not fail to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in verse number 10, John said, and he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Now this little phrase, seal not, interestingly, when Daniel was told the future, way back in, in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, and verse number 9, God, God told him that this knowledge would be sealed. You can read that, till the time of the end in Daniel 12, 9. But now John is told the future, and then specifically told not to seal it. So we could say that during Daniel's day, or what in Daniel's day was sealed, is revealed in John's day. We have made this statement numerous times. You've heard many people make this statement. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. We might say that Daniel saw the end from the beginning but John lived to see the beginning of the end. It is true of many Bible truths previously, it is true that many of the Bible truths previously not understood are just now beginning to make sense to you and I. There's a lot of things that are beginning to open up, uh, becoming far more clear to you and I as Bible students, such as the pre-trib rapture, the nation's fulfilling the typology and the visions of Daniel and things such as that. Some of the things, uh, some of the truths were not understood previously simply because of the uh, dark ages. These things were concealed by the uh, Roman Catholic uh, persecution. However, God has certainly illuminated the minds of some great men and given us the opportunity to read many things from the Bible and uh, gifted other men to write things for us that we can learn many great truths from the Bible. I want to give you just so quickly some, some great books to read. I'm just going to mention them. You can read them if you want to. Clarence Larkin's Dispensational Truth, Phenomenal. Peter Ruckman, The Sure Word of Prophecy. Gail Ripplinger, New Age Versions. E.M. Bounds on Prayer. Gene Edwards, Tell of Three Kings. Lawrence Vance, The Other Side of Calvinism. And just a small list of some great writings that you can read that are surely surely give some great insight to the Bible. But John was told not to seal up the prophecy of this book. Look at verse number 10 again. He said unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecies of this book, for the time is at hand. So it certainly is true that there are many things, especially in the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, that is difficult portions of Scripture, many of them for us to understand. And But I think during the tribulation period, those, those, those people that are actually alive on earth during the tribulation period, I think a lot of those things that are hidden from you and I and Daniel 
and revelation are certainly going to be open for them to understand as they're living out or living during this particular time that the Bible is writing about. And so, for the time is at hand. Now, verse number 11. Verse number 11. Here's a I'll give you some practical stuff. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Now, from a practical standpoint, there will come a time when it's too late to change. I, I just, I just want to encourage you this morning, don't wait too late to change. If you, if you happen to be here this morning or somewhere under the sound of my voice and you are not saved, can I encourage you today to understand that now is the time? I, I wouldn't continue to, to put that thing off or to wait or or do you think that you have a certain amount of time, or you want to be a certain age, or you want to accomplish a certain amount of things, or there's something that you want to do. You, you, have, you have full intention of someday trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior, but maybe there's something that your flesh is desiring that you want to accomplish before that time. Can I tell you, you may never live to see that accomplished. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't mess with that. I'd get saved today if you're not saved. If your heart is not right with God, I wouldn't keep messing around with that. I would fix it today. If, there, if there's things in your life that are not right, I, I would just fix it now. If you're living in such a way that's not pleasing to God, I, I wouldn't keep on messing with that. I'd just get it right now. And listen, if you're not serving God with your life, I'd fix that now as well. There's something you can do. There, there's something all of us can do to be involved in the ministry and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'd fix that now. I, I said that because this. The Bible says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. One of these days, many folks are going to die in an unjust condition. And for all eternity, they're going to be unjust still. One of these days, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is going to die with sin in his life and sin in his heart, and that's going, to, that's going to be there when he stands before God. One of these days, an individual is going to have wasted their whole life not doing anything for God, living their entire life for themselves, and they're going to die in that condition, and there's going to be no way to change that at that time. Do something for the Lord now. Fix it now. Now, it's practical. Doctrinally, those that are unjust and filthy will be unjust and filthy for all eternity in the lake of fire. I want to just mention something quickly. I'm not, gonna, I'm not preaching on hell or the lake of fire again this morning as we did from chapter 20 and chapter 21. I want to tell you something. You, this, is, this is hard to imagine, but this is true. You know that that lake of fire will not change anyone? It won't change them. They went there in an unjust, unrighteous, ungodly condition, and they'll be unjust still and ungodly still a thousand years after being in the lake of fire. Two thousand years after being in the lake of fire, they'll still be unjust, they'll still be ungodly, they'll still be unrighteous, they'll still be cursing God, they'll still be mad at God, they'll still be blaming God, they'll still be blaming you, they'll still be blaming someone else. The fire will not change them. They'll be ungodly still. It's a horrible condition. Why in the world would you want to die in such a condition? Why in the world would you want to go to hell from a church pew? Why would you want to go to hell having an opportunity to hear a preacher preach to you about the salvation and the grace and the mercy of a loving God and slip off into hell having the key to salvation in your head and having the key to salvation and the knowledge of that in your lap and let you refuse to accept the Lord Jesus Christ your Savior and you die in your sin and a million years from now while you're in hell you'll still be unjust. 
It'll still be the preacher's fault because he didn't say the right thing. It'll still be your parents' fault because he didn't set the right example. It'll still be your friend's fault because they didn't give you the right advice. It'll still be your wife's fault because she didn't allow you to trust Christ. It'll still be your husband's fault because you felt like you had to be obedient to him instead of trusting God. I want to tell you something, friend. When you die in an unjust condition, you're going to be unjust still for all eternity. I'd trust God today while you still have opportunity to do so. The good thing about that is those who are righteous and holy will remain righteous and holy throughout all eternity. Ain't that a blessing? There will never be anything that can separate us from the love of God. Hallelujah. And listen, with that warning, with that stern warning from verse number 11, where it says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He which is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And the very next verse says, And behold, I come quickly. What a blessing, you and I, that have been made righteous by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Behold, I come quickly. What a blessing those of us who know the forgiveness and the pardon of sin and our, 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 our sins has been washed away and, and we're righteous in the sight of God. I am glad that he comes quickly. But let it be a warning to you that are unrighteous still and those who are unholy still and those who are filthy still that he comes quickly. Maybe you are disillusional. Maybe you have bought into the lie that, that this is a fairy tale. And all of your life you've heard that Jesus is coming and you've decided that it didn't happen in your grandparents' lifetime. And it didn't happen in your parents' lifetime. And now you're whatever age you are, it hasn't happened in your lifetime. So maybe you're become of the assumption that it's not real. Listen, friend, it's real. Whether you believe it is not or not, it is real. But let me tell you this. What if he comes for you today? What if, what, if, what, if, what if he's, what if behold I come quickly, just suppose that that means I'm coming quickly for you. It might be before you're 15. It might be before you're 20. It might be before you're 25. It might be before you're 40. It might be before you're 50. It might be before you're 70. Listen, friend, he could come for you today. And if you die without the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be ungodly still. And you're going to be unrighteous still. And you're going to be filthy still throughout all eternity. I trust him today while there's still time. Behold. He said, Behold, I come quickly. We talk about the word behold a lot in the Bible means to stop, means to pay special attention to, means to slow down what you're doing, get your mind off of everything that's going on and comprehend this truth, I'm coming. And whatever condition it is that you're in when I come, that's the condition you're going to be in for all eternity. Don't be filthy. Don't be unrighteous. That rich man in hell, he's still there today. Ever how many hundreds of years ago that it's been that he died putting his trust in his riches and in his wealth instead of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's still in hell. Do you know that he's still begging for water and not one drop has ever come? Do you know that he is still begging for someone to tell somebody else about Jesus? It's too late for him to hear about Jesus. He's probably still blaming the preacher. He's probably still blaming Lazarus. Why didn't Lazarus tell me about the Lord instead of begging for food? Why didn't Lazarus, why didn't Lazarus tell me? And Lazarus probably did tell him about the Lord. I don't know. Behold, I come quickly. The word behold, this is the last time of 26 occurrences. The word behold is in the book of Revelation. Of those 26 times, six of those announced the Lord's coming. Now notice what Jesus said here in this verse. If you notice, if you have a Bible, 
the words of the Lord in red, and even not context, you can tell. He says, the words of Christ. He said, behold, I come quickly. Notice what he said, and my reward is with me. Now, the rest of the verse goes on to say, to give every man according as his work shall be. So, you know there's going to be some giving out of rewards. I understand that. But look what he says. <clears throat> we know that Christ is going to reward those that have been true to the faith. But this verse doesn't say, your reward is with me. It says, my reward is with me. Now, what does that mean? Well, this, this, this statement it applies back to during the tribulation time and the church, the bride of Christ, that is, the, that is Christ's rewards for suffering and she is coming with him when he comes. This goes all the way back to Revelation chapter 19. When the Lord is coming back and you and I are coming with him, he said, I come quickly and, and my reward is with me. Can you, can you fathom that in your mind? That Christ reviews you and I as his reward. That's mind boggling. And yet it's true. We have no idea how much he loves us. We, we know the verses. We, we know that Romans 5 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Christ died for me. Well, I, I know that verse. You know that verse. You can quote that verse. But man, if we would ever comprehend how much he really had to love in order to die for me, <laughs> I, have, I have two grandsons. And I promise you, I don't love any of you enough to give either one of them for you. You may be the, the most upright and outstanding member of society. You may be the best Christian that God has. You may be the best member that Bear Trail Baptist Church will ever know. But you'll never be worth my grandson. And yet Jesus Christ, God gave his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for a vile, wretched, God-hating, God-denying, blasphemous, rebellious individual such as you and I. That's love, friend. And then he says, after we're redeemed and he's coming back to this earth, my reward is with me. I'm bringing you with me. You are my reward for my dying for your sin. Man, what a blessing. Now, the great reward, the great reward for those who served Christ is to be with Christ. We certainly understand that there's going to be rewards given by Christ that is coming that could not be distributed at the judgment seat of Christ. We understand all of that. Now look at verse number 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Now, we know that Jesus said this at the very beginning of Revelation chapter uh, number 1. He said that in verse number 8. He said, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. We know that, the first and the last. Now, now we're at the end of the book of Revelation, and he's made that statement again. And what a great blessing it is to have that repeated. Not only is the phrase in and of itself true and wonderful and great, it's, it's at the, in the first chapter of Revelation, and it's in the last chapter of Revelation. He's the beginning and the end. And uh, so uh, what a blessing it is to have a, a great Savior. We're not going to say a lot about that verse. Come, the next verse is problematic. Blessed, it's not problematic for the Lord, it's problematic for human understanding. Blessed are they that do his commandments, and they that have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Now, <clears throat> without a dispensational approach to the Bible, you get in all kinds of trouble with uh, verses like this in the Bible. In fact, the Seventh-day Adventists hit this verse and decide that commandment keeping wasn't done away with at the cross of Calvary, though you and I know that it was. And so they are still teaching today that you have to keep the commandments to be saved. You and I know that no one has ever kept the commandments, and even if they did, keeping commandments is not salvation. 
We know that the New Testament teaches differently. The, the passage of Scripture in Colossians chapter number 2. Let, let's turn there for just a moment. Colossians chapter number 2, verse number 13. We'll start reading there. Colossians chapter number 2, verse number 13. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now, how in the world is it possible that all trespasses have been forgiven? Verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So you and I know that the Lord Jesus Christ took those laws, took those commandments, he nailed them to the cross, you and I were not able to keep them. That handwriting of ordinance has been blotted out against us. If we've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, our personal Savior, I say thank God for that. So we know that we're not keeping the commandments to be saved. We understand that. Now, I, hear, I notice this as well. Unfortunately, there's not any that, that I could find. Bible commentators that did a lot better with this verse, every one of them changed the verse. I am never going to change the Bible because I don't understand what it says or what it's teaching. And you better not either. <laughs> they, they change the wording of the verse, say that it doesn't mean what it's, how it's written. It should have been written this way. I mean, let me tell you this. The Bible says, blessed are they that do his commandments that they might have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. We know from chapter 21 that New Jerusalem has gates. We know that it's a city. I, that's, the, that's the problem that I have with the verse. There's no commandment keeping for you and I to get in there. There is. I know that this is going back to some tribulational teaching. I know all of that kind of stuff. Here, here's what I'm saying. I know that salvation for the New Testament saint is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, period. There's nothing else added. And so, uh, what, whatever all of this is talking about, I promise you it is right, it is correct, it is exactly as it should be in the King James Bible. It does not need altering, it does not need changing, it does not need revising. There's nothing wrong with the Scripture. Praise God for that, amen. Complete confidence in the Bible. There's, so there's obviously things about this passage that we don't understand. However, we do know that there's no contradictions in the Bible. So we certainly understand that this cannot be directed to the church-age Christian because church-age Christians dwell in Jerusalem. We know that, New Jerusalem. We also know that from Calvary forward, we that live in this age of, of uh, the church age, we, are, we become saints by one thing, and that's by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. And there's several verses for that. Verse number 15. Well, the Bible says, for without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Now, for without are dogs. The doctrinal application of this is simply this. Presently, those who are without Christ are without a lot of things. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20 that they're without excuse. In verse 31, they're without understanding and they without, are without natural affection. In chapter 3, verse 21, and also 1 Corinthians 9, 21, they're without law. In Romans chapter 5 and verse number 6, they were without strength. Uh, strength. In Romans chapter 10 and verse number 14, in many cities, they're without a preacher. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 12, you are, you are without Christ. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6, they're without faith. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 13, they're without hope. And so, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are without a lot of things. That's a doctrine lean. Here, in, in eternity, in eternity, the wicked shall be barred from the blessedness of the new earth, the new heaven, and new Jerusalem. 
They that choose a life, choose the Lord Jesus Christ, accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, they're going to get an eternity with God. Those who reject Him are going to get an eternity without God. We talked about that in Revelation 21 8, where the Bible says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So the lake of fire, the Bible, we, we understand clearly that it's going to be populated with some things. And first thing the Bible refers to is dogs. It's going to be populated with dogs. Now I'm not talking about your four-legged little furry friends. The reference here to dogs is speaking of false teachers. I'll show you that from the Bible. I think it's, I think it's worth looking at several places in Scripture. Come to 2 Peter chapter number 2. I know it's almost 12 o'clock, and you say, Preacher, you're just now getting to a Bible study, and it's 12 o'clock. That's going to be problematic. Not for me. <laughs> 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Dogs are often a reference to a false teacher. Look what the Bible says. Verse number 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, skip all the way down to verse 22, the same chapter. The Bible says, But it happened unto them according to the true proverb that's what it says the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed in her wallowing in the mire so could clearly be a reference to the false teachers and the false prophets that are mentioned in verse number one dog now you say i don't know about that preacher okay all right come to philippians chapter three. Oh, it's clear as mud now we'll see if we can get it as clear as ice water Philippians chapter number 3, verse number 2. You, you know the phrase. Philippians 3, verse number 2, beware of dogs. What does it say next? Beware of evil workers. And then it carries it even further. Beware of the concision. So beware of dogs, beware of evil workers. I'm quite certain that a false teacher, a false preacher would be an evil worker. Beware of the concision. concision. This is a reference. This concision is a reference to those who are still relying on their circumcision or their good works for salvation. Come to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. It's about these dogs being false teachers, false prophets, false preachers. Psalm 22, I'll say this before I begin reading. This psalm, Psalm 22, is a prophecy of the Lord's crucifixion. Look what the Bible says in verse number 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Now, skip all the way down to verse 16. For dogs have come past me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. So we, we're, we're talking about the fact, we mentioned the fact that this is a prophecy concerning the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that it was the false religious leaders of that day, and the false teachers of that day, that bargained for the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're referred to as dogs in this psalm. Come to Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56. Look at verse number 10, I believe it is. Isaiah 56. I'll read verse number 9. All the beasts of the field come to devour. Yea, all the beasts of the forest. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. Now look at this, they are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. 
Yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. So these, these dogs here are a reference to unfaithful ministers. They are blind watchmen. They are likened to dumb, greedy dogs. Now, come to Matthew chapter 7. These truths that we just learned concerning these dogs being a false teacher or a false preacher. Notice how that helps explain this passage of scripture right here in Matthew chapter 7. Look at Matthew chapter 7 verse number 6. Find it myself. Look at, look at this verse. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. You don't, you don't give that which is holy to false teachers and false prophets. Now, the Bible goes on to say in that verse of Scripture, in verse number 6, Neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Seems like we mentioned this during our um, Bible class back in the last semester on um, how to study the Bible. These pearls, we may mention this pearls earlier as well. The pearls are people. I, th I think specifically in this passage, speaking of new converts, and so they, these pearls, they are precious to God. They are not to be cast before dogs. It's, it's interesting to me that in this verse of Scripture, he uses dogs and swine just like he uses dogs and pigs in the first passage we read in the book of 1 Peter or 2 Peter. And so we, we, he says here, Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast you your pearls before the swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you so god help us not to give those little ones over to false religion false teachers false preachers they're pearls they don't need to be cast before the swine now come look at come down to verse 21 same chapter so there'll be a host of people who have religion many of whom will even be leaders within religion and all they have is religion they do not have the lord jesus christ as their personal savior I promise you they will be barred from heaven. For the Bible says in verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, I tell you, our world today is full of this kind of religious idolatry and wickedness right now. All over. I, I, I don't, on TV, I don't, I don't have that uh, capability, and I'm glad that I don't. But just, just on Facebook, and all of the, uh, I, the majority of my friends are, are preachers, religious people, and all this. So all the time there is this, all, every single time that I click on the thing, there is some kind of religious program popping up. It is unbelievable what's in the world today. Not that it's new. It's always been in the world. It's new to me, I guess, because I haven't paid that much attention to it. But the overwhelming vast majority of it has nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all religious garbage. say, I don't know about that preacher. Well, we have a count of it in the Bible with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Look at that, John chapter 3. John chapter 3, the Bible says, I think it's in, in verse number 1, that he is a, a ruler of the Jews. Jesus himself said in, in verse number 10, um, Jesus called, said he was a master in Israel, but he don't know Jesus, so he might have been a ruler of the Jews. He may have been a master in Israel, but look what the Bible says in John 3, 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so there's been many, and there are many religious leaders who do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They will not, I promise you, I don't care how religious they are, the Lord doesn't know them, even though they have done things in His name, and they will not be in heaven. Let's look at one more place, 1st 2nd Timothy chapter 3. I can see already I'm not going to get anywhere near as far along 
as I intended to get today. Second Timothy chapter 3. Here's a passage we are very familiar with. I think we should read it again. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse number 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. I think we're there. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. <laughs> well, we certainly know that's true. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. I'm pretty sure we have all those covered. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, that means uncontrolled sexual lust and desires, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Look at, look at verse number 5, the first part of the verse. Having a form of godless. Of having a form of godliness. So that, that is religion, that's religious leaders. The Bible refers to them as dogs. They have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, we are commanded to turn away from such. So without our dogs. Now, <clears throat> come back to our passage in, in Revelation chapter number 22. Revelation chapter 22, the lake of fire is populated with dogs. The lake of fire is also populated with sorcerers. Now, we identify this word of sorcerers with Satanism, spiritism, witchcraft, the occult spells, magical arts. But listen, it, it stretches far beyond that. It, it stretches into uh, potions and drugs and, and uh, enchantments and all kinds of things. And let me just say this right quick. I'm not going to keep preaching here, but I'm going to tell you this. Alcohol and marijuana are still drugs. I don't care how much the government legalizes them. They are still wicked and ungodly and unrighteous and wrong. Amen. I heard I had two I, two different preachers preaching about alcohol this week. I hadn't heard uh, preachers preach against the the dangers of alcohol in a long time. Heard two different preachers doing that this week. What a blessing! I'll tell you right now. You, you, I, I don't have any idea who's listening. I don't, don't ever allow yourself to think that there's nothing wrong with taking a social drink. I'm, I'm just gonna have a good time. I'm, I'm just going to uh, enjoy a little bit of time with my friends. I'm just going to drink a little wine, take a little edge off so I can rest. It is a trick of the devil. And it is a gateway to all kinds of problems and troubles and wickedness and ungodliness. And that, that's wicked. Amen. The lake of fire would be populated with sorcerers. It would be populated with whoremongers, which is free sex. That sure isn't hard to visualize in our society. We are, we are a society full of nakedness, full of nudity, full of lewdness, full of looseness, unfaithfulness to our spouses, and the cheapening of virginity is open season with us today in America and all around the world. It's still wrong. Somebody say amen. You girls ain't got enough sense to keep your clothes on, and your daddies ain't got enough backbone to make them. There's something wrong with both of you. It's wicked. It's all right. You men ought to put some clothes on too. Praise the Lord. Just it's okay, isn't it? You ought to dress right. You ought to cover yourself up. Save yourself from marriage. Don't be loose. Don't be loose. Be chaste. Keep your virginity. Amazing, it gets quiet in a Baptist church when you preach on such things. It ought to be basic. Lake of Fire will be populated with murderers. I have little doubt that the entertainment industry is dulling the minds of millions through TV, movies, and video games that propagate, or whatever how you say that word, of murdering and killing and stabbing and shooting and punching and slapping and Preacher, it's just entertainment. No, it's dulling your senses to a reality. Murder is wicked. Murder is ungodly. Murder is irreversible. The lake of fire will be full of those who plotted against and murdered the saints of God through the ages. They'll finally receive a just reward for what they've done against some of God's choicest servants. 
taking an innocent life will bring the judgment of God. I tell you, this mass murdering of millions of babies that's going on in our wicked world today, and it seems like the world over is rejoicing in the fact that we, we get excited about killing babies. You, you, you want to know what's wrong with America today? The millions of babies that we legally, legally, as far as the law is concerned, kill each year. The lake of fire will be populated with idolaters. Man, we're full of idolatry. It doesn't have to be Baal or Astaroth or Moloch or the beast of the tribulation. All who refuse to worship the God of the Bible are worshiping idolatry. The lake of fire will be populated with those who maketh a lie. That is those who have manufactured a lie, such as the cult religious leaders we mentioned earlier. I, I'm, I'm out of time. Y'all are done. I know that. Oh, let, me, let me mention this. Let me give you just a couple of these religious leaders. Y'all ought to know their names. Judge Rutherford, the Watchtower and Jehovah Witnesses. Hell's going to be populated with the likes. Muhammad, the founder of Islam. Buddha, the founder of Buddhism. Roma Karishna, the founder of Hinduism. Jim Jones, the cult leader. The self-proclaimed faith healer orchestrated a mass murder suicide in Jonestown, Guyana, November the 18th of 1978. Mary Baker Patterson Glover Eddy. Get married a bunch of times, you'd have a bunch of names. You found your own church and call it the Church of Christ when what you really are is a promoter of baptismal regeneration. Hell will be full of the likes. Joseph Smith, founder of Mormonism and the Latter-day Saints. Ellen G. White, the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist cult. And many millions of others who maketh a lie. People believe that lie and are deceived. So the Bible says, For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I'll stop right there because you don't want me to get on a pointed application talking about dogs. I'll tell you this. It's a sad thing that we're living in a culture that has placed animal life above human life. It is, it is a natural affection when creatures whom God hath made for our food and to work for us as laborers has become the focal point of our society. The fact that thousands of people have more love for their dogs and their cats than they do their boys and their girls and the elderly people shows well the term unnatural affection in 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. Listen, I, I, I don't have anything against dogs. I've had dogs in my life. I, I have a lot of cats. I don't own a cat, but we, somebody set out some feral cats at our house several years ago in the field that I have below us, and we have wild cats. I mean, you don't ever have to worry about them coming up to you or petting them or anything like that, but I see them. I go in the barn, and they run out of the barn, and I go down the driveway, and they run out of the tiling hole. So I don't have anything against animals. I've, I've had some dogs in my life I liked really well. I want to tell you something. If you say that a dog is your best friend, I feel sorry for your spouse. I feel sorry for your children. I feel sorry for your, sib uh, your siblings. I feel sorry for your neighbors. I don't like that preacher. That's okay. It's true. It's an unnatural affection. According to the Bible, dogs are unclean. Isaiah 66, Matthew 7, dogs are cruel. Psalm 22 and I, Jeremiah 15, dogs are profane. Deuteronomy 23, they're gross and disgusting. 2 Peter. Everybody that puts a beware of the dog sign up in their yard is quoting the Bible. They are. You ever witness to someone or talk to a Christian who with a straight face would say, I'm, I'm not interested in going to heaven if my pooch isn't going? You laugh, but that's despicable. Amen. 
church members in the USA spend more money each year on pet food than they do foreign missions. The same nation that protects puppies aborts babies. The man that will strike his wife with his fist will pet his pooch. The woman who will backtalk her husband will talk sweet to her puppy. For without a dog, without natural affection. Firemen who have wives and children at home who love them and need them and rush into a burning building to save a pooch. Not thinking about the consequences of a wife who's going to be left husbandless or children left fatherless because of a dog's life. This ain't popular preaching. But it's good to recognize that God created human beings to, to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and to fellowship with Almighty God. And He did not create those animals with that same level of respect. Animals clean themselves with their tongues and then lick your hands and face. And you talk about being a clean freak. I'm glad we have a Bible, don't, aren't you? I'm glad Jesus loved us enough to redeem us from our sins. If you don't know him, listen, I've said a lot of things. Try to get your attention back and be funny at the end. One of these days you're going to die. And one of these days I'm going to die. When I stand before God, I don't want him to say that you rescued and petted 49 puppies. I want him to say that you gave your life to witnessing to lost little boys and girls and men and women who were dying without God and going to hell so that they could be saved. There's, now, there's nothing. I, I may get a dog someday. I don't know. I may. I've had dogs before. I may get. I'm not against you having a dog. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm just talking about natural affection. Don't love them more than your spouse. Don't love them more than your children. Don't love them more than your neighbor. Don't love them more than the drunk and the sinner that needs Jesus. Amen. Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for being good to us.